The following podcast is from Pathway Community Church. More information about Pathway can be found at www.pathwaycc.net. Please enjoy this podcast, and we pray that God will meet you while you listen. All right, so we're going to talk this, we're starting a sermon series uh, called Stranger Faith. And I'm really excited about this ser- sermon series um, for, for an interesting reason. A lot of you guys might be privy to what's going on in the Christian world as far as mainstream Christianity. Some important people are starting to turn away from Christianity. And I'm watching these people turn away from Jesus, and some of their excuses are interesting. Things like, well, the Bible, hell isn't being talked about, which is just false. It's being talked about. Miracles don't happen, which is false as well. It's just we don't see them the same way that, say, the Bible does. And they have these things where they're saying, look, faith just doesn't add up. And the truth is, guys, our faith sometimes doesn't seem like we should have it. Um, It's weird. It's strange. God can tell us strange things, especially in His Word. There's a million and four stories in the Bible. I try, I'm trying not to call them stories, but because it, you know, but events, happenings, historical things that happen, whatever you want to say, in the Bible that are, that stretch us. A lot of people have a problem with a snake being able to talk in the garden. Was it a snake? You know, and so they get into that debate. A lot of people have a hard time thinking that a guy can raise from the dead three days after he's been killed. Um, so, so these are some issues that we really want to look at, and we want to examine them and find out, do we really believe what the Bible has to say? Because if we don't believe it, guys, then we are wasting our time, like, this is 100% of a waste. It's a nice day outside. It's the summertime. It's cool. It'd be much better for us to be fishing on the lake or hunting or whatever it is that you like to do than to be in church if this Bible, if this book right here is not telling us the truth. Okay? So go ahead and open up into your Bibles into Jeremiah chapter 32. Um, as Rob likes to say, there's, there's a table of contents in the beginning of your Bible. If you don't know where Jeremiah is, you should be able to find it. It's the biggest book of the Bible. Um, I know people are going to be like, oh, that's Psalms. No, it's not. little Bible trivia for you. The longest book of the Bible is not Psalms. It is Jeremiah. So uh, when you have it, go ahead and stand up, and we're going to read the Word of God um, starting in verse 17. And he says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. You show loving kindness to thousands and repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them, the great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. You are great in, the cou- in counsel and mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Jesus, thank you so much for your word, and God, as we study how great you are, I just ask that you would, your presence would be here. Just like if the Bible is false, it's a waste of time for us to be here, Lord. It's a waste of time for us to be here if it's just me standing up here saying words. So, Lord, I pray that your presence would fall on us this morning, that you would be here, that you would speak through me, and, and Lord, help our hearts to change. We love you so much, and we thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done. In your name, amen. Specifically speaking, in Jeremiah, the main verse that I want to focus on is the first one. It's the easiest one. But he says, there is nothing too hard for you. And I want you guys to be thinking of the question today. Two questions. One is the title of the sermon, How Big Is Your God? And two is, do I really believe this? Okay? Those are important questions for us to answer, and we like to talk about Jesus a lot, but we're going to talk about some Old Testament characters that actually lived that are real events and whether or not we believe them. So again, I'm going to have you guys kind of flip this morning. I have my handy-dandy finishing nails in all of my places in my Bible. Um, So turn to uh, Judges, and we're going to to start in uh, chapter 16 of Judges, but we're going to talk about a few chapters before that as well. Uh, Some of you guys may be familiar with this from Sunday school. If you grew up in the church at all, you definitely know this story. If you didn't, then 
get ready, it's a fun one, um, of Samson. Now, Samson was a judge of Israel. He was born miraculously. His mother was barren, and the Lord showed up and said, hey, you're going to have a son. And she dedicated him to the Lord um, in all of his ways, including having him take a Nazarite vow. And he grew up um, kind of a pretty awesome dude, um, just beat people up and took, took names, whatever. Um, but I want to explain what a Nazarite vow is before we go too deep, because it, it, without sort of an understanding of what a Nazarite vow does, you won't really get what we're trying to say here with, uh, with Samson. Sorry. So a Nazarite vow, to, be, to take a Nazarite vow means that you're consecrating or separating yourself from the world. You're doing something other than. You abstain from all alcohol that's, that's uh, derived from grapes. So wine is out. Um, I'm sure there's others, but wine is the one example that I'm going to give. <laughs> I don't drink a lot. Um, also, you refrain from cutting your hair um, at all. So a razor does not touch your head. Um, you also abstain from coming into contact with graves or dead people, which most of us don't have a huge hard time with that. Um, if you come into often contact with a dead, people, a dead person, I hope that you're a mortician. If you're not, then you've got problems. Um, after a designated time of, of these abstinences, you will cut off all of your hair. After the designated time is com completed, you'll take a, a, an essentially a bath. It's called a mikvah. It's, it's kind of like the Jewish version of baptism. And then you'll cut off all your hair at the tabernacle, and you'll offer up three sa sacrifices, a lamb, a, uh, sorry, I want to make sure I get this right, a ewe and a ram. Okay, so three sacrifices, and then on top of that, they'll, they'll take all of the hair that they shaved off of their head, and they'll put it on that final offering, and they'll burn it. And it's basically a symbol of just a peace offering. And if you want more on the peace offering and what it involves, you can go to Numbers chapter 6. We're not going to go there today because we just frankly don't have time. Um, I'd love to, but we don't. So we have Samson here, and he's, he's pretty cool. In chapter 15, you can read some of the things that he did. One of the things in chapter 15 that it focuses on is he gets kind of a, a bee in his bonnet against the Philistines, and he decides to uh, kill them. Uh, they, they don't like him. He doesn't like them. So he kills about a 1,000 of them with the jawbone of a donkey. Okay, that's pretty impressive. I don't know how you would go about killing a person with a jawbone of a donkey, but I imagine it's a fairly bloody thing. And I imagine that it's pretty impressive to kill a thousand of anyone. Um, so, so you have this guy that's going around, and he's very strong, and the Philistines can't get him, and they can't kill him. They try and ambush him, and they can't, and they, and they can't figure him out. And so then we come to chapter 16, and this whole time in, in all of Samson's story, the, the idea is, well, where does his strength actually come from? Is it his vow that he took? Is it his hair? Because his hair is super long and flowing and lockly. You know, like he looks like Legolas running around and killing thousands of people. Sorry, I'm a nerd. If you guys don't get that reference, I apologize. Um, so, so is that where his strength comes from? And, and we tend to think that his strength comes from his hair, but that's just not true. Okay, his strength comes from God, but his oath was an important symbol to God. Okay, so it's important that he has this Nazarite vow going because of the fact that he's consecrating, he's separating himself to God. And so we have this guy, and he's going around, and he's, he's killing people, and so the Philistines come up with this plan because he goes into a girl and sleeps with her, and of course, the, the root of all evil is women. Sorry, that's just truth. You can, like, prove me wrong. <laughs> um, uh, that's where bad things start to happen. Um, and so he goes into this girl that he shouldn't be with, and he starts sleeping with her, and he likes this girl a lot. Well, the Philistines decide, you know what, we're going to get this girl on our team. And so they approach her with about 1,000 pieces of silver, which roughly is, is $200,000. Um, I don't know if that's American or Canadian, I guess. Uh, so like 5.3 million Canadian, $200,000 U.S. Um, they, they, go, they go to her and they, they say, look, figure out his weakness so we can get this guy because we just hate this guy and we want to kill him. Like he's killed a thousand of us or more at this point. It's probably more like 1,500-ish. And we want him dead. So you need to find out the secret to his strength. 
Well, of course, Samson is no fool, and so he continues to sleep with this girl, because he's no fool. Um, he had a sin, guys. He had a sin problem. He has the, the sin of lust, and if you guys, you know, if any of us in this room say that we don't struggle with it, you're either 10 years or younger, or you're a liar, okay? So he's struggling with this sin, and he's trying to figure it out, and he's working it out, but he's playing with fire the whole time. He decided that he's going to be cute, and she would ask him, oh baby, oh honey, oh sweetie, what's your secret? And he would play with her because he thought it was fun. So the first time in chapter 16 we see it, um, he, he says, if they bind me, in verse 7, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So she goes and betrays him and says, Samson's, the Philistines are upon you. And, and he wakes up, breaks the bowstrings, and beats them up and chases them off. And she plays the girl card and says, well, you're mocking me. And I'm sure there were tears involved and whatever. And he says, no, no, sweetie, it's okay. I'm just playing with you. It's fine. So she asks him again. <laughs> and and, she, and he, so he tells her, um, he says in verse 11, he says, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be, be like any other man. So again, she does this. She wraps him up in ropes, and she says, the Philistines are upon you, and he breaks free from the ropes, and he beats them up and chases them off. You mocked me. I'm sick of this. You're a terrible person. You're not going to get any anymore because you're not telling me the truth. And Samson is like, no, sweetie, honey, it's okay. I want you, and we are in love. And so she asks him again, then tell me what will cause you to be weak. And he says in verse 13, and this is a key one. Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave my, the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, then I will become weak. Do you notice what happened here? He lied completely the first two times. Like it was like, whatever, no big deal. Seven bowstrings, seven ropes. It's not even close to the truth. But he's getting a little bit closer to his oath. He's start, she's starting to mess with his hair now. And again, does his power come from his hair? No, but his oath is very key in this. And so she, if you weave my hair, we start to do that in our lives, guys. We don't have a problem with sin, but we keep playing with the fire, and eventually it becomes, well, if you just mess with me here, then it'll work. And it may not be true, but it starts that ball rolling. And he started the ball rolling on this. He's a little bit closer. So she does it, and again, I don't know why he stays with this girl, because every time he tells her anything, she tries and tricks him into, or tries and kills him, essentially. Um, and so she leaves his hair. It doesn't work. And this time she's serious. She, it says in verse 16, it says, It came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words. Never experienced that and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. I mean, this is more than just nagging, guys. This is constant. I mean, his soul was vexed to death. That's a pain in the butt. All right. Uh, it says that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. So, long story short, uh, sorry, long story, mediumly long, um, she shaves his head, the Philistines come, he's powerless to fight them off, first thing they do is gouge out his eyes, and then they tie him to essentially the stone pillar of their temple and mock him, and he has to perform for them um, like a circus animal. So, fast forward, uh, this goes on for some time. And he's just kind of sick of it. And so he, he asks the boy that's helping him find his way around to help him find the supports of the temple so he can lean on them. In verse 27, he says, Now the temple uh, was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. In fact, there were about 3,000 men and women on the roof uh, who watched while Samson performed. It says, Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. He's still kind of selfish in his thinking. 
Um, and Samson took hold of the two middle pillars, which supported the temple, and braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's uh, and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. Okay, so this is a great story. I'm not going super deep into it. I'm sure that you guys have questions about Samson and Delilah. So if you have any more, again, rob at pathwaycc.net. He'll answer all of your questions for you. Um, what I want to point to is, guys, this is a story, like a, a fantastic tale, right? And it's really easy to read this and go, huh, did it really, though? Like, I'm sure, I'm sure that the, when it says the pillars of the temple, it just meant a couple of sticks that were holding up the tent. And there were a lot of people in this tent, and, and those tents were heavy, and so maybe a few people got hurt, but I doubt that 3,000 people died right then and there. And we're not even addressing the issue that Samson's last act was to commit suicide. I'm not even going to talk about that, because that's a deep, deep subject um, that really... If you guys want to talk about that, call me. We'll do a one-on-one. -on -one. But that's a big thing that happened right there. But let's talk about just the fact that 3,000 people died in one blow. That's essentially, I mean, we're talking, that's a blow to the Philistines. Huge one. Do we really believe this? Do you guys really believe that what the Bible says right here actually happened? Because if you believe it, then good, you're on the right side of the fence right now. If you don't believe it, then you're going to immediately start questioning, okay, what other parts of the Bible didn't really happen? Or maybe it's being facetious. Or maybe it's being a little bit uh, overly, you know, wordy. Samson is a rare story of a person that kept on, and I say rare in, in a facetious way, um, it's a rare story of a person that kept on struggling with his sin. I'm not going to ask you guys to raise your hands, but how many of us struggle with sin on a daily basis? How many of us deal with things that we can't quite get over? And God still loves us in spite of us. So the story of Samson, the event of Samson and Delilah, whatever you want to say, because again, I don't really know what a better term for story is, but the, the thing about Samson is that if this happened, then that means we still have hope for forgiveness. We still have hope for reconciliation to God, because that's essentially what happened here. Was it his hair that gave him his strength? No. And in the end, he says that. He says, God, give me the strength. God gives us our strength. Now, a lot of us are thinking, well, how many you know, Philistines did you kill yesterday with the jawbone of a donkey? None. Okay, so it's not necessarily a physically strength. I'm not going to pull any semi-trucks with you know, my own strength. I'm not looking for that kind of strength in my life. I'm looking for God to come down on me and use me in a powerful way. And Samson was looking for the same thing. He wanted God to be glorified in the end. And so God is willing to honor that. So again, answering the question of whether this happened or not, guess what? I'm not going to do that for you today because that's a personal decision that you have to make. I can tell you that God is big. And that's why this sermon is called, How Big Is Your God? Because we have a God that does things that we don't understand on a daily basis. Whether you see it or not, guess what? Everybody go like this. Everybody go, do it again. Okay? All of that was a gift from God. He, you didn't deserve any of that. He gave it to you. Nobody drop dead right now, otherwise this is going to be really bad. <laughs> God gives us life, and, and you all have blood running through your veins, and we all have air coming in and out, and the complexities of carbon monoxide and dioxide and H2O and whatever else that's water. So, I mean, all these things, like, all of those things are gifts from God that He doesn't have to give us, and I definitely don't understand how it works all the time, but I'm thankful that it does, and I want to understand more. Okay? The desire is that I can get closer to God through understanding His Word more. So read the story of Samson. Next, we're going to go to some, some would say a harder one. Again, just, I found this out this last week, guys. Side note, if you have finishing nails laying around, they are fantastic Bible placeholders. Like, you can, anyway, sorry. Okay, so uh, turn to Numbers chapter 22. 
We're going to talk about Balaam and his donkey. And again, if you've been in Sunday school, this is an even less taught one, uh, but it is a good event that happened here in the, in the Scripture where we kind of can skip over it if it makes us feel uncomfortable, but it requires us to have faith. So we're going to kind of read, kind of not, just bear with me on this one. So starting in verse 9, uh, Balaam is a ruler over Israel. He's like a priest, if you want to say that. There was no judges at this time, so he wouldn't have been a judge. He just was a priest of Israel. And um, Balak comes to Balaam and says, hey, I need you to come and help me uh, defeat my enemies, all these things. And Balaam, he's smart. He's like, I need to talk to God. So he talks to God and, and uh, asks him what he should do. In verse 9, it says, Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, uh, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they, are, they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall uh, not cur- uh, curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to give me the permission to go with you. Perfect answer. God says, no, I'm not going to do it. Sorry, guys, go home. Now, the idea here is these guys are offering him money to come and, and curse the people for them to win. They're, they're offering him, and it may not be just money, it may be cattle or sheep or, you know, whatever else, servants, um, donkeys were a popular um, currency back then. Uh, but the idea is they are giving him something to come with them, and he says, no, God says, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, And they basically say, ask him again (laughs) for us, please. We really, really need this. Um, And then it says, let's see, they'll they'll honor you greatly um, in verse 17. So he says, look, I'll even if Balak was to give me his house, I still wouldn't go because the word of the Lord said no. So they say, please ask God again. And, and so in verse 20, it says, And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come uh, to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak you, that you shall do. Okay, I want to read that verse again because it's super important. Words are important, guys. It says, And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. Verse 21, So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. There's a missing part to this story. Do you guys catch it? The men didn't come to him. He went to them. Okay? He decided that he wanted to go. And, and, you know, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission, right? So, whatever. So it says in verse 22, Then God's anger was aroused because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were there with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way of his, with his drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck his donkey and turned her back onto the road. It's kind of a funny picture, just some little fat dude riding off into the field on his donkey. Um, I don't know if he was fat. I just like to picture people fat. It makes me feel better. <laughs> All right, so it says, Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on his side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw that the angel of the Lord, she uh, pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. And I'm sure there were some swear words involved, um, or at least definite anger. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn, either to the right and to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And I love it. Without missing a beat, he says to the donkey, Because you have abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. How missing a beat talks to a donkey. Uh, So then the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours? To this day was I ever disposed to do this to you? And he said, No. Uh, Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in his way, sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. 
And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you, because your way is perverse against me. And he says, The donkey saw me and turned aside uh, from me these three times. And if she had not uh, turned aside from me, surely I would also have killed you by now. And, let, and I will, uh, sorry, just lost my place, and let her live. So again, he sees the error of his ways, he sees the angel of the Lord, which is powerful enough, but he's got this donkey here that's talking to him, and not just talking like weird like words, we're talking a full-on conversation with an animal Balaam is having right now. Do you guys believe it? Do you guys believe it? I mean, this is a donkey. It's not something like a donkey. Sometimes you can get, like with, in, in Genesis, it talks like, like a serpent, or or like this, or like that. No, this is a donkey. He's riding on it. It's a real live donkey. It probably smells like a donkey. I'm sure that some of you guys have been around a donkey before and know what they're like. Do donkeys talk? You can, there, this isn't a trick question. Do donkeys talk? No. So do you believe that this one talked? Why? See, here's the thing, is we, we say, well, because the Bible said so. Okay, that's great. But I'll tell you this, for a person that doesn't live to the standard of the Bible as their, as their end-all, be-all of how to live their life, they're going to think this is nonsense. They're going to think you're crazy. They're going to think that you talk to donkeys on a regular basis, even if you don't. <laughs> I mean, I don't remember the last time I've had a good conversation with a donkey. Um, but why do we believe that the donkey talked in this case? Well, we have the context of the angel of the Lord opening its mouth. That's nice, but that requires a God that is bigger than what is normal. And I think that we forget how big God is. Balaam was forgetting how big God is. I'm not saying that it's his fault that, you know, the donkey crushed his foot or whatever, and I'm not saying that the angel of the Lord pushed his foot into the wall, but I'm sure that that really hurt. I don't know if you guys have seen old walls. They're not exactly like smooth, <laughs> like a donkey running your foot into the wall would hurt a lot. So I get that there's some, some frustration there, but guys, God is big enough to tell us where to go. God is big enough to tell us, big enough, sorry, words are hard, big enough to tell us what to do and how to do it. Are we listening is the question. Because Balaam wouldn't have found himself in this place. We wouldn't have had a, a, a tale about a donkey talking had Balaam listened to God. Because God said, if they come to you, then go. And they would have come to him because they were already offering him money. They would have come back and offered him the money and he would have been able to go. But he wasn't patient enough to wait for God. So God had to intervene in a way that was going to get his attention now, I don't know about you guys, a donkey talking would have been attention enough for me, but apparently it wasn't for Balaam because he starts arguing with this donkey. <laughs> like, and, and not only arguing, threatening. I'm going to kill you. You're lucky this isn't a sword or you'd be dead. Like that's, that, that tells you his frame of mind and how upset he was that this donkey that normally never talks started talking to him and without a beat, you're dead. You're like, I'm going to kill you. Like, and, and so, is God big enough to make a donkey talk? These questions that we ask are super important for us to answer in our own hearts more than anything else. Can you live with a God that's big enough to change the rules? I'm not saying break the rules. He can bend the rules, though, anytime he wants that's what a miracle is, a supernatural miracle. You know, deists, it's funny, deists will try and take away miracles. That's basically the main point of a person that is a deist, is they believe the Bible is true except for they take out all of the miracles. There's a lot of miracles in the Bible, and, and they take all of them out. So you don't have a resurrection of Jesus Christ. You don't have a resurrection from the dead for us. You don't have, you don't have a virgin birth by any means. Um, it's Big Bang or no, nothing, you know, like there's no miraculous anything. They, take, they castrate God, is what deists do. Is God bigger than that? Is God able to say, look, it's a virgin birth? Do you believe it? Or is all of this just a show? 
When we come here on a Sunday morning, are we just doing this because our parents made us do it when we were a kid? You know, maybe you're a lucky one and you got, you got saved after your parents, you know, or, or later on in life, and so you, you're starting a new trend for your family. That's great. Why are you here? Like, is it just to enjoy the fellowship? Because I got to tell you guys, there are people in this world that like hanging out outside of church. Is it because the chairs are comfortable? Is it because the building is here? Is it because it's a Sunday morning and there's nothing better to do? Or is it because God is God and you want to be here so that you can get closer to Him? I know which one I want to be true in my heart, but sometimes, guys, it's not. Oftentimes, when bills are due and kids need clothes or they're sick or I'm sick or the car breaks down or you name whatever happens... Oftentimes, my first response is not to call on the Lord. My first response is not to ask God, how are you going to show yourself in this? And how, how can I be faithful to you in this? My first response, well, most of the time, my first call is to my parents because I've got good parents that love me a lot. You know, maybe some of you guys, if you guys are mechanical and my car breaks down, you're going to be my first call because <laughs> I have no idea how to do anything in a car. Um, except for drive it. But guys, my first response, my first call, my first action should be to go to the Lord. I shouldn't come to church because I'm bored on a Sunday morning. I should come to church because I want to experience a close relationship with God and His people. Now, you guys have heard me say, and I'll say it again, and I'll say it 20 more times to you, church is a supplement to your daily living. Sunday morning, if this is the only Jesus that you get in your life, guess what? You are missing the point. Because Monday is only a day away. And if you turn away from God on a Monday, and you only turn to Him on a Sunday, then guess what, guys? That's not a relationship. That's tradition. That's religion. That's, that's a schedule. And Jesus doesn't want us to have a schedule. He wants us to have a relationship with Him. And when we have a correct relationship with Him, I will tell you guys, the things that you start seeing in your life that shouldn't make sense start happening more. I've, I've heard stories of, of bills getting paid to the dollar amount with like a check that's just tucked on somebody's windshield, like for the exact amount of money that they needed to pay this bill. I've heard stories of people that their car falls on top of their kid or something like that, and, and there's actually like some cool science behind this, like with adrenaline and strength, but like little old ladies, like 80-year-old ladies, like picking up the car so their grandkid can get out from underneath the car. Yeah, there's science that explains that, but if you tell me that God isn't involved in that, I'm going to have a hard time believing you, Okay. I've heard stories of people that were at the end of their rope in any way, shape, or form. You can't think of anything worse, and they come to Jesus because they know He's their only hope, and guess what? They know that their life can get better just because they're following Him. I'm not saying happier. I'm not saying like better financially or anything else, but because they're following Jesus Christ, they know that everything is taken care of. Our money is God's. Our time is God's. Our house is God's. My kids are God's. Everything that I own is Jesus Christ's, and He needs to be able to use it in the way that He wants to. And so how big is your God? Do we put Him in a, in a, in a box and say, God, it's really cool, and I'm going to come to you when I have financial difficulties? I'm going to come to you when I have health problems? I'm going to come to you when my marriage is already broken and in shambles? Or do we go to God first and say, God, thank you so much. I want to do preventative medicine, not reactionary medicine. If, if you're a parent, and a lot of you guys are, so think about this, and some of you guys have older kids, some of you guys have younger kids, fast forward or rewind to when your kid is 19-ish years old, okay? Everybody, everybody there? Think about that time, and if your kid comes to you and is broken and hurting and needy, as good parents, we would want to help that kid. Am I right? Everybody go like this, or else you're a terrible mom or dad. Yes, you want to help your kid. Okay, but if your kid keeps on coming back, and the only time they ever talk to you is when they need something, 
Are you still going to help them? Absolutely. You love your kid. There's nothing that can change that. But it changes the relationship, doesn't it? The relationship becomes reactionary, where I know I'm only going to hear from little Jimmy when he's in jail, and, I, and he needs me to bail him out. We treat God like that quite often. Like he's my genie in a bottle, and I'll contact you when things are out of hand, God. But until then, you just stay in the back seat and don't bug me. And guys, I'm scared that we as a church, that we as modern Christians, treat God like he's only big enough to take care of certain things in our lives. If you have a headache, some of us, I know, I know some of you guys because you've added me on Facebook and I can sit back and observe some of you guys post for every hangnail, sliver, headache. Everything is like, oh, geez, my Facebook community needs to know that I scratched myself this morning when I was getting ready. Pray for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'll pray for you, but it won't be for health. All right. Mental health, maybe. But, <laughs> but other people are very private, and they might be going through stage four leukemia or something really, really hard, and then they post on it on Facebook, and people are like, oh, sending thoughts and prayers your way. Fantastic. I don't have a problem with either one. Really, I don't. If you have a headache or a hangnail, please come to me, and I'll pray for you. I don't mind. But I love listening to the prayers of some people, because you have a person that has a hangnail, and they come and ask for prayer, and I've seen it as a pastor. I don't know if you guys see this on a daily basis, but I've seen it, where these guys will be like, Jesus, pray for this hangnail. Thank you for how good you are. You're just super awesome. Bless them in their day. Help them to get past it. Amen. And then the person with, you know, cancer comes up, and it's, oh, Lord, here, could we get a few elders up here? Oh, Lord, we just thank you that you are good. We understand that your ways are not our ways. Help us to work through this. Cure her miraculously. Be this person's God right now. And it's like this thunderous, like, spiritual prayer. That tells me how big you think God is. Because God cares about the cancer just as much as he cares about the hangnail. He cares about the headache just as much as he cares about the marriage that's falling apart. He cares about those things, and we should go to him for everything, not just the big stuff. And we should trust that he cares about us, that he's going to take care of it. You guys understand what I'm going here? Like, does this make sense? Do we believe what God says he does? Like, what he says he is in this Bible? He is a God that can bend the rules. He is a God that can do whatever he wants. He, can, he is a God that is God. And if he's not God, then guess what? There's something that is God that's bigger and better than him. But in our Bible, he proves that he is God. It's a confusing statement, but God can only be God by being God, otherwise something else will be God. You guys follow that? Anything that I put before God is a God in my life, small g. Anything that I put before God is an idol. Anything that I love more than God is an idol. Like there's a, there's a Jimmy Needham song that's called Clear the Stage, probably one of my favorite songs of all time. Um, fantastic to put it into perspective of how big God is and how little I am and how much I need him. Guys, we need to be relying on God to take care of everything for us, and we need to trust that God, God's word is true. And we need to live our lives as though it is true. So I challenge you guys to look in your life and find the small things, find the big things that are going on in your life that you say, that doesn't really make sense, and seek God. Turn to Him for what you need. Turn to Him for things that you think you don't need Him for. Is that a good challenge? I hope so. All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for who you are. God, I thank you that you are a God that loves us so much. I thank you that you're a God that guides us, that provides for us, that takes care of us. 
God, I thank you that you put stories in the Bible that we can look to that don't make sense, that are weird, that are strange, that make us actually look at, do we really believe what we say we believe? Are we really willing to take that leap and say, yes, God, you are able to make this work? And then do a little bit more study on how. Do a little, more, a little bit more research on who you are. God, I pray that you would show yourself to us in a mighty way. Lord, for that person that's riding the donkey and beating it to death, I pray that you would open their eyes. Lord, I pray for a miracle in our lives. I pray that you would just be God in our lives and that nothing else would even come close. We love you so much, Lord, and we thank you for who you are. We pray these things in your name. Amen.